we can um, start. Okay. So I will start, of course, by saying good morning or good night or good afternoon, wherever you are, and uh, for thanking everyone for being here, both the speakers, the participants, and everyone else who is here with us. Um, as you know, this is actually the first webinar we are carrying, in, carrying out in 2021, but this is part of a series of webinars that WCAA has been organizing since April 2020, so basically when the pandemic hit us here in Europe. And so these WCA webinars are actually um, an org uh, webinars that we organize every month or every two months. We're, we're going to probably do it every two months uh, this year. WCA, as you know, is part of WOW, the World Anthropological Union. Um, so it's part of WOW together with IUAES, the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences. This webinar, as was mentioned, I think by a recording and by Michelle, will be record and will be recorded and it will be available at the site of WCA WOW. So it will be online, not today, but shortly in two days or so. And you will also be able to look at and listen and watch all the other webinars we have been carrying, it out, carrying out since uh, 2020. Uh, I want to special thank to, well, the WCA organizing committee, my committee, my colleagues who helped me in organizing these webinars, especially uh, Virginia Dominguez, Carmen Real, and Michelle Bouchard. Uh, a special thanks also to Michelle Bouchard from the University of Northern British Columbia, who is the technical uh, Zoom host of this uh, webinars. Ricardo Faguaga from Mexico, who's in charge of the communication task force of WCAA, and Silmara Takazaki from Brazil, who always so kindly makes the posters and uh, save the date. Um, notice as well. So having said this, great uh, junction of uh, scholars from all over the world, as we always try to do, we will have from South Korea, Yang Ying Yung from Seoul Univers National University, from Iran, uh, Shohela Sashahani from Sahid Behesti University, oh. Tierra. I hope I'm saying it is correct. <laughs> from Israel, Nurit Bird David, University of Haifa. From Norway, Thomas Eriksson from University of Oslo. And from Portugal, João Pina Cabral from the Institute of the Social Sciences of Social Sciences in Lisbon. As you know, if you have watched our previous webinars, uh, we always go from east to west uh, for a simple reason that in the east it's it's later. So I truly thank my colleagues that are in the eastern part of, of the world who are of course uh, already in a very kind of late schedule. So without further ado, I would just like to read a few of the sub themes or questions, you can call it as you wish, that we have sent the speakers just as you know, guiding sub themes. As uh, I said in the, in the mails, no one has to actually abide to these sub-themes or questions. But basically, since the theme is rethinking home in turbulent times, and we are indeed in turbulent times all over the world, uh, the sub-themes uh, were basically four. One of them is in anthropology and for anthropologists, home can have various multifaceted meanings. What does home mean for you and for anthropologists in your country or in your region, or you, either where you live, but also where you work as an anthropologist? The second sub-theme is think of the pair house home and how in the meaning of home, the idea of the space as something symbolically built but also capable of building its own symbolism is present. We thought of, for instance, uh, Israeli houses with panic rooms, rural villages, uh, which are divided in, 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 into exogamic halves, etc. The third sub-theme is home in turbulent times is certainly, certainly pertinent in these times of pandemic. But what other sense of turbulence have you experienced in your work or your field work as an anthropologist? And finally, last but not least, again concerning the pandemic, who do you think is most affected by it, especially in the places where you usually do field work or would do field work? Is it everyone? Is it labor migrants in particular, young adults, children, elderly? And is it related to the notion of home at all? Of course, 
these sub-themes always also touch upon issues that we have discussed in previous webinars, such as inequalities during pandemic, uh, doing different types of fieldwork during pandemic as digital fieldwork, etc. So thank you once again, everyone. And I will start um, giving the word to our to our colleagues, I will just very, very quickly present them. Uh, I apologize because I don't read long uh, bio notes because we don't have, have time for that. So it's just a few notes, just so people know who you are. So to start with South Korea, our colleague from South Korea, Yang Yin Jung, professor at the Chang Department Jin of Anthropology. Sorry? Yang Jin Jung. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Professor in the Department of Anthropology at Seoul National University, South Korea. She teaches psychological anthropology and her research considers the intersection of culture, emotion and self in North Korea, South Korea and the United States. Then Shohela from Iran. Uh, she's an associate professor of anthropology and head of the Department of Social Sciences at Sahid Beheshti University in Tehran. She was vice president of the IUAS and uh, funded the IUAS Commission on the Middle East several years ago. Nurit Bird David, um, Professor Emerit, <coughs> University of Haifa. <coughs> She's the past president of the Israeli Anthropological Association. She currently researches middle class homes in Israel and global Airbnb in stay ho hosting in private homes. She also did uh, work on hunter-gatherer cultures and uh, has an award for life achievement of the International Society for Hunter-Gatherer Research. Thomas Eriksson from Norway is professor of social anthropology at the University of Oslo. His research mainly concerns local responses to global processes and he publishes on politics of identity, cultural complexity, accelerated change and public anthropology. Juan Pina Cabral uh, is a senior researcher at the Institute of Social Sciences, Lisbon, before he was at the University of Kent for a few years. He was founding member and president of the European Association of Social Anthropologists, Anthropology, he, be, beyond several other associations that he helped and was also a founding member. His thematic interests are the relation between symbolic thought and social power, family and kinship in comparative perspective, and ethnicity in colonial and post-colonial context, amongst others. So having presented all this, I will start with our first colleague from South Korea. I will, Yang Jin Jung, I'm not saying this right, so I apologize, but please, you have the floor. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. Um, I'm Yang Jin, uh, uh, speaking from Seoul. Um, it's so exciting to be part of this World Anthropologist Forum. Thank you very much for your invitation. Um, regarding the theme, home in turbulent times, I thought of North Korean refugees living in South Korea and realized that home is not a simple matter. Perhaps it's not a simple matter to all of us. For this webinar, I'd like to share some reflections from my research on North Korea and North Korean refugees and try to show the multifaceted nature of a home, which in this case involves such conflicting feelings as longing and betrayal and the merging of the political structure and thoughts and feelings in the conception of home. In the English idiom, hearth and home, the two go together, where the hearth is, home is, and vice versa. But a North Korean refugee once told me, quote in translation, even when the hearth died, it's still your home, referring to her former country, North Korea. She was telling me how hardworking and loyal she had been to the North Korean state while living in North Korea. When she said so, she let out a deep sigh. She said she was happy to be in South Korea and determined to make it a new home. She was especially happy for her child. But things were apparently more complicated than that. The poignancy is at multiple levels. The socialist hearth of North Korea has long died and the people are struggling to revive it. 
just briefly for your information, there was a severe famine in the late 1990s in North Korea and, um, and close to 1 million people died of starvation and mal mal malnutrition. The economy has since recovered, but things are still uh, pretty bad in North Korea. When the state's claim is that North Korea is one big loving home, Hamokan Daegajong, many North Korean homes suffer from the lack of provision. In the name of one big loving home, surveillance machinery taps into each and every home. Living home, North Korea, is forbidden, but if you did leave, you are never able to return home, and so on. Refugees journey everywhere is disruptive and disori disorienting and often dangerous. But to North Korean refugees, the risk and psychological burden is exacerbated due to the national division and the ongoing Cold War politics on the Korean Peninsula. Escaping from North Korea is not just illegal, but it amounts to a political crime. Still, Many cross the China-North Korea border, and a large number of North Koreans are residing illegally in China. The, the es estimation ranges from um, 10,000 to 30,000. Those who get caught by the Chinese authority are repatriated to their home country, North Korea, where they face a severe punishment. Those who manage to buy a brokered path to South Korea have to walk through a per perilous border area into a third country before being handed over to a South Korean embassy there. After coming to South Korea, some adapt relatively quickly, but many others go through bouts of guilt and homesickness. Their feelings of guilt are acute because North Korean government might retaliate against their remaining family members for their defection to South Korea. I stop here for now and later tell a little bit more about the political dimension of home in North Korea. Thank you. Okay, thank you very, very much. Um, I forgot to mention that we have the chat on the right side of your screen. In this chat, people are coming in, they are presenting themselves. We always ask for people to write where they come from. So we have an idea what the range of the seminar is and uh, who comes in. And of course, later on, after all the participants, the speakers have spoken, uh, questions and comments will be written on this chat and we'll try to summarize them so that we can address them when we go to the stage of the open discussion. So thank you very much to Hyang. Uh, sorry if I'm not saying it correctly for keeping to the time. I ask all the speakers to please keep to five minutes. Actually, you didn't even take five minutes. You only took four. Uh, take to, you know, uh, respect the five minutes so we can have a first round of uh, comments, you know, of um, to talk by the speakers and then we can go back to the speakers and then finally have the open debate. So now we go to our second um, speaker who is from, um, from Iran, from Tehran. Let me see if I yes. say this right. So it's Sohaila Sahashani. Shashahani. Sashahani. Sashahani. Sasha Hani. Okay. So it's actually much easier than what I was making it. Sasha Hani okay. from Sahid Behasti, University in Tehran. Thank you very, very much for being here. And please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. You can hear me? Yes, very well. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I have related. Uh, well, first, I would like to thank you for this international organization. It's really great. It takes us out of our uh, usual everyday a very isolated work. Uh, I have related to what uh, you asked us very personally, and I have tried to uh, to describe home as it has been in Iran. And I, first I would like to say, well, we all know that home is a very culture bound term, and it depends upon the, uh, the culture which uh, defines what home means. In Iran, we have been passing turbulent times very, very often. So our home 
must be really a place where we feel uh, protected. It should be a refuge. And if you attend to the cosmology of uh, the traditional Iranian house, you would have the sky in it, water in it, uh, you would have animals in it, the fish and the bird, and a reflection of the sky in the pond, which was originally in the Iranian garden, which was the paradise, which is reflected in the Iranian carpet. I'm, you know, pushing lots of ideas into um, a number of uh, very small sentences. So, uh, given that we have always uh, uh, experienced some kind of raiders or some people coming in, home has always been a refuge to us. And uh, now what happened last year with uh, this event, which happened and limited as these turbulent times as you have uh, talked about, uh, it was the private domain uh, which has changed now. We do not live in those traditional houses where we have all the all all the earth ref reflected in it. It is our private uh, apartments which has to somehow um, perform a very important function. For those of us who live alone, it means something else. Those who live in the family, it has one meaning, but. For, for those of us who uh, have a more restricted life, it has definitely a, a different meaning. I'm not going to go into all that. Um, I'm going to tell you about the two locations in which I have been living. One is my home, my apartment where I live, and the other is my library where you can see me now. I spend most of my time here. And I realized at the beginning when this turbulent times came, I was limiting myself to my apartment. And uh, my first reactions, um, when I think about them now, uh, are a few, which I would like to talk to you about them and then pass on to my actual life. Um, my first reaction was to uh, speak in a way to my friends to give them um, some energy and some hope and see how we can take care of this. And I uh, summarized it into making something which I actually didn't do it, but the idea was nice to make hug me shirts. Hug me shirts for all those people who wanted to hug each other and could not do it. Lots of parents were suffering from this. And I thought if I make uh, these hug me t-shirts, then I can give one to each parent and to the children, and then they could experience this and get over this uh, problem of touching each other and being afraid of each other. The second thing was to do what I had always wanted to do and never did. And one thing was to make cakes. So for a few days I did that, but I got very bored with that. And I realized that wasn't my cup of tea. The third thing which I did within the apartment where I lived was to take pictures of the objects which I had been collecting all these years. So my home became my atelier d'artiste, all the objects which I had collected, and they were particularly in clothing area because I have written on clothing. All the clothing, all the hats, all the socks, and all these things came on the table. I took pictures and I, I have been keeping them. And quite a number of um, metallic objects from rural areas. I also took pictures of them. But then I realized, oh, I can't just continue this because I have run out of objects. What should I do? Then I realized I can go to my library because I don't see anyone. And I go within my car to my library. So I started doing this. I would not be touching anyone. I would not be crossing anyone. So I started this life of living in two places and going by my own personal car to this place and coming back. And going and coming back, I realized how much better life had become because we had less pollution and we had much less traffic jams. So I would zip through these 13 kilometers going one way and another, and then continue my work. And the first thing I did is to get rid of lots of junk, which was in my library. And I have been getting more and more organized. And I have been doing the work which I have been wanted to do for a 
quite a number of years and I had not been able to do. So I have been uh, working much better now than I think before. And um, what about my international relations? Right at the beginning, I started a message to my colleagues at the IOAS and the Commission on, on the Middle East and quite a number of others telling them, please write the stream of your thought. What are you doing every day? And I got quite a bit of reactions to that. We went up to seven or eight letters of people responding to me. And I have that in a collection and I hope to share that this summer in a commission meeting that I'm proposing, uh, a Zoom meeting, I suppose. What else have been taking place which have been of some interest? I have continued my trips outside of, of Tehran and uh, how and where do, have I gone? I have gone to a number of different locations where I did my work. And because I knew that those people were not seeing anyone who was contaminated and I was not contaminated, so I could go to this, those places. And those places I really felt at home because I had stayed there for a number of uh, weeks, days, uh, months, et cetera, et cetera. And I could relate to those places very easily as homes again. But another thing which happened, which was of some interest uh, to us was that last year I was supposed to go to the US for the wedding of my son. Okay, that was to take place in the month of May. Um, in the month of September, finally, they decided they were in Hawaii that they were going to take care of that. So we held a wedding online. So my home became the place where I had all the objects, all the gifts, and I had one person from my family coming there. But then there were people from Paris, from the Bourgogne in France, from San Francisco, and my son and her future and his future in-laws in Hawaii. So this was an event where home became home again. Home became a place of ceremonies. So, you know, recently, homes are no longer places of ceremony. And during the COVID, we heard that there are no more ceremonies, but the home became again, a place of ceremony. Why? Because I heard my son telling me, everyone was talking about your table and what you had done because they had not made any preparations, but I had made lots of preparations. What I was going to take with me probably to San Francisco or something, I could put everything on one big table and show it to everyone. They were happy because really people thousands of kilometers away from each other, they could not speak about much. And uh, uh, anyway, this uh, held everyone busy at least for one hour where there was the ceremony and then the gift exchange, it's a, a future exchange, gifts which were shown um, on it. So anyway, this has been how I have been leading my, my home life, borrowing from the past, uh, living in the future and being in contact with my international uh, colleagues and uh, of course I have continued my courses and so on and so forth. I would be with you in case there are any questions. Thank you very much, Ohela. Um, thank you very much. So we've already had two different views of what home can be or how it can be looked upon. Uh, so now we will have our colleague from Israel, Nurit Bird David from the University of Haifa. Nurit, are you there? I can't see, it. you were in the screen before. I am. You are. Um, okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, great. Please. Can you hear me? Good. Yes, you yes. Me? Very well. Yes, yes. There you are. Thank you very much. So I continue in this vein. And I want to start saying that home is a word that we use so easily, but it's very hard to conceptualize it or to conceptualize what it refers to. It is even hard to translate from the English word home to other languages and back again. Uh, and it, so it is really great that we discuss in this forum uh, what home means cross-culturally and of course it changed historically. Uh, and I think it's a first stage before we discuss uh, home in turbulent times. Because for me as well, senses of home very subtly express nothing less than cultural, social sensibilities and even social ontologies. Uh, take, for example, the Israeli, the Hebrew word bait. Uh, in Israel, we speak Hebrew. Hebrew is the language of Israel. So 
the word bait uh, translates both into home and house. The distinguished made in English is not applied, it's not applicable here. Furthermore, we can use bait as synonym with family. Moreover, bait is a prefix for a whole range of public spaces that accommodate communal activity. For example, Hebrew literal, literally has home of the hill for hospital, home of books for a school, home of prostitutes for Brussels, etc., etc., etc. Even Israel itself, Israel is the name of the country, is actually referred to often as the national home. Uh, moving from home as an idea to home as a space, which is also important before we discuss home in turbulent times, the modern Euro-American home form has been globalized and normalized for many major 19th century and 20th century global phenomena, colonialism, missionary work, development paradigm, consumption trends, etc., etc. Basically, this is a home for a nuclear family, world from public view, and it expresses the modern project of separations by function and category through its internal uh, design, parents' bedroom, children's bedroom, bathroom, kitchen, front door for guests, back door for tradesmen, etc. Yet local uses challenge the modern logic. Take again Israel as example. Uh, because of its war history and threats of rockets, uh, the law currently obligates building a special room in any newly built room, apartment throughout Israel. This is a room that uh, can shelter from rockets with extra thick iron fortified concrete walls, a thick door and a window, but it is an ordinary size room and people creatively use it in other than a war time uh, as bedroom, children room, office, storeroom. So the Israeli home design, otherwise conforming to the Euro-American modern standards, subverts the war piece binary and partly the modern strict special divisions by function. And with these two notes, I come to the home in turbulent time, the COVID-19 pandemic. It is everywhere now used, I think, in ways that undermine the modern logic. The incredibly fast spread of Airbnb with 10% of the world population already using it is one important phenomena that may have, perhaps I will go into in the discussion. But here, I just want to, to, to direct you to your screens. Uh, most of us speak from home, our home, whatever part we choose to speak from with whatever appears on our screen, reflecting our ideas, taste, personal decoration, pets, sometimes children, uh, other family members, constitute now an inseparable background of our appearance in public. Uh, literally and symbolically, I would say even ontologically, we no longer leave our home beyond as we go out to the public sphere. And this undermines many modern binaries, including home, work, private, public, family, workforce, relational, individual self, and also practically, we negotiate and challenge modern home division standard as we perform at home, what we used to do in specially designed public spaces. We, do, we work, we do sport, we, we consume culture, whatever. And finally, even leading home design firms already advertise multiple use furniture for small homes to cope with this uh, time. So I would, I would like, I, I'm very happy at the opportunity to discuss this emergent global home transformations with its cross-cultural variants and how it institutes a new sociological and cultural order that may perhaps may outsurvive the pandemic. Even when hopefully we'll have it behind us, we still might stay with a new kind of home. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Nurit. Am I saying your name correctly? Yes, very correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you so much. We've had already a few a few thoughts on different topics, which is this is this is what's interesting about this international webinars is that each person gives you know a different uh, viewpoint on this. Uh, we we have about 110 people attending here, uh, which is also a, the only good thing about the pandemic is that now we do everything online and everybody can be here. And the other thing is that we can see each other without a mask because we are online. So we will now go to our next uh, speaker, Thomas Eriksson from Norway, please. And thank you so much again, Thomas. Well, thank you, Clara. It's a pleasure to see you and it's lovely to see the rest of you as well uh, in this uh, odd format that we're getting used to. Uh, I suppose it makes sense to have home and the question about home as a topic. Uh, not only because, as Nuri rightly pointed out, we all somehow are at home, aren't we? Because we are not allowed to go anywhere. Um, our government strongly advises us against leaving the house at all, if we can avoid it, right? Yeah. So, uh, which makes for some interesting social experiments, you know, and it's uh, for us as social scientists, very interesting to, to observe how people respond, and not least how people respond in different societies and at different times. Uh, and uh, and also uh, obviously because we simply we are at home and uh, and we have learned a few lessons in this last year. For example, this kind of webinar, uh, which is rewarding and it's transnational and it's global, and you can have participants from all over the world. And many of us have taken part in quite a few of those webinars in the last year. And uh, the technology was there long before the pandemic, but we somehow never started to use it properly, right? And now we're learning it. We know that it's not the same thing. It will not give you an experience. I will not be able to go out with you afterwards, Clara, and have some vino verde and some nice Portuguese fish and to watch the beautiful architecture. So I will not have any memories to bring with me, but there are also rewards. You can do it from home and it's cheap and it's carbon neutral and it has a number of other uh, properties. So that's one of the things I think we've learned in academia in general, but also as anthropologists, it's learned something. We've learned something about this. Uh, now to respond to some of the questions or to begin to respond to the questions you, you sent out. Uh, um, what does home mean to us where we uh, sort of in, in, in the, the place where we are and as anthropologists? Well, lots of people around us have had to redefine the projects really quickly. Either they would have to do it electronically, like my student who was planning to go to New Zealand. Um, she had to do some kind of electronic substitute feedback. And as we all know, it's not the same thing, but what can you do? Um, and some uh, have just to change their field site. Like another colleague was planning to spend his sabbatical in the Dominican Republic, following up on his long-term engagement with people in the Dominican Republic. Uh, obviously couldn't go there. So he now has a, uh, um, uh, another project, uh, which is somehow similar, which is also to do with the environment and, and with some of the issues to do with climate, but located very near where he grew up, just a few miles from where he grew up. And this recalls, somehow, some of the experiences that some of us have, having had to change our fields to that which is close, that which is domestic, which is nearby. It, it recalls something that Joy Owen said at an earlier webinar in this series, namely that at, at the South African University where she worked or where she studied, the, the white students were encouraged to study the other. They, uh, preferably they should go far away and study the other. Whereas the black students uh, were encouraged to study their own kind because they already knew the language and the culture. Uh, so uh, there is a lesson to be learned here about what is near and what is far, what is home and what isn't home. Uh, some of our colleagues uh, have gone into the pandemic uh, full force. And for example, uh, some people I'm, I'm collaborating a bit with who have a kind of design anthropology um, sort of a firm and they're involved in urban planning. So they, they've been doing service among people during the pandemic to see to what extent they live more sustainably. Do they travel less? What kind of conflicts arise from working at home? Does working at home lead to um, new digital divides between people who can work from home and people who can't work from home? And other people who can't work from home just happy to get out? Uh, or, or do they suffer because they expose themselves to risk? That sort, of, uh, that sort of question. Lots of people have bought dogs, which I think is a very sort of, uh, it's a short term thing because you have a dog for 15 years and the pandemic may last a while, but they just needed something to do. And they could no longer go off on a weekend trip to Lisbon or, or on a summer holiday to, to the Canary Islands. So they, so they bought the dog. And, and many bought rowing machines because the gyms are closed, right? Because we're not allowed to come together in large groups. We're only allowed to meet a few people. And this 
uh, has been going on for a year now in many parts of the world. And it's extremely interesting to see how we respond to that, isn't it? So the significance of the domestic fear, uh, to, to just to linger a little bit with Norway, um, it has also become clear to us because this is the country where the domestic sphere is very important. The home is very important. You invite people into your home as a sign of friendship. You don't go out to a restaurant because restaurants are expensive and alienating and so on. It's not like Southern Europe where people take people out to restaurants. You invite people into your home. And so the significance of the domestic sphere and the, sphere and the boundary between the home and that which is outside. The last advice we got from government just now was, please avoid to invite people into your home unless they already live there. So if they're part of your household, so my son who studies in Switzerland, he was somehow still at home here <laughs> and he brought the bloody virus with him <laughs> from Switzerland. But he was safe because he belonged to the household. You see, he was at home, even if he hadn't lived there for more than three years. So we, we learned about this. We had, a, we had a cabin ban in this country last year. Just before Easter, people were not allowed to go to their cabin in the mountain during Easter, which to the Norwegian middle class is something people relate religiously to. It's even more home than the place where you live. It's like a family farm, your cabin. It's sacred because it attaches you, you see, to nature and to tradition and to what it is to be Norwegian. And most people, they somehow swallow their pride and their resentment and accepted it, you know, high level of trust, okay? It, it says something about this kind of society. They accepted it, but it also highlighted the significance, the importance of domesticity and of, uh, uh, and, and of, uh, of home. And, um, uh, so the attachment is, 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 is very strong. And uh, also for, to follow up a little bit on what Nurit said uh, about uh, inviting people being invited into each other's homes. I think many of us now know what it looks like in the prime minister's kitchen, at least we do. Uh, and we know exactly, you know, what kind of painting the, uh, uh, the Minister of Finance has on his wall. He, he doesn't have an Australian painting like I do, okay? He has a different one. Uh, so there's something strange here about the extremely intimate relationship you get online and the very distant, remote, uh, you know, alienating uh, experience you get where people have no smell, they're two-dimensional, they have no body language, they've hardly got any gestures. So, um, yeah. Uh, very quickly, if I can, uh, just one, one more minute, is that, if that's okay, Clara, the people I'm working with, I'm, I'm working with island people mainly in the, in the Indian Ocean, and they feel very isolated and they despair. Can you imagine what it was like when the, when the Minister of Finance in the Seychelles was asked or he had to present the revised national budget in April? Okay, last year. Uh, this is a society where you have two legs to stand on in the economy. There's a small, very short leg, which is called tuna fish. And there's a very big one called tourism. And from one day to the next, the big one was gone. And they rely so much, and they, it's so important for them to be connected, not just economically, but, but, but in every way, because it's a small people way, way out there in the ocean, all on their own. Mauritius, a bit similar, which is the other, but it's larger. They, they cope somehow, but they, uh, they, they despair of be, feeling isolated from the world. I think I have to stop there. Many more things we could talk about. And thanks again for, for a great uh, theme and, uh, and for inviting us, uh, Clara and the WCAA. Now over to Rao, I guess. Thank you very much, Thomas. So we've had a whole bunch of, of topics here. And this, this issue of the intimate relationship that we have online, I think, is very interesting because it's sort of ambiguous, right? On the one hand, we cannot hug each other. We cannot go out to drink, as you said, but we can see your prime minister kitchen. So it's very interesting. So besides this, this being um, uh, watched by 108 people now, we are also streaming online. I forgot to say that in the beginning, but I suppose my colleagues had already said it. So it's being streamed online through Facebook. And as I said, it will, it will also be on, on the website. So last but not least, my, my friend and colleague, Juan Pinaco. But I, I think... Um... Wait, my, sorry, somehow my sound went away. Can you hear me? Can you hear I me? I can hear you. Okay, all right. Um, so last but not least, uh, my colleague and friend from Lisbon, from the Institute of Social Sciences, João Pina Cabral, you have the word. Well, thank you very much. Um, you can hear me well? Great. Um, well, speaking after Thomas is always a difficult task, right? Uh, yeah, it was so interesting to hear what he has to say and, and, and some of that really, uh, and what, of what the earlier people talked will come in what, in what I will propose. 
my first preoccupation when Clara sent us this paper, uh, that, those proposals, was um, really in Portugal, we don't have homes. In Portugal, we have casas, houses. Uh, there is a word for home, a lar, which means fireplace, but it's kind of, nobody uses it. You know, if you go out, when you return, you go, ho you go to your house. And that sense of place of inhabitation is very important because the house is not only the place where you inhabit, but it's also the place of joint economy. So even if you live alone in your house, your house represents an, an economy where, the other, where other people might have lived too. And so that sense, that sense of partiality is, is really important because Nobody in Portugal has a house that is really closed inside their, corn, their walls because houses grow like people do. They grow from each other. In Brazil, they have this expression, they say, as casas são puxadas das casas dos pais. Houses are, are pulled out of their parental houses. Um, and so you create these links of houses. Um, it's very interesting because of course in the countryside, it, it has one aspect, in the city it has another. In the countryside, you basically marry your cousins. So a, a, a hamlet is a network of cousins. Um, it, it, you, you see these houses, they all look separate, but in fact, they're all interconnected. And that's the reason why they share so many things, but it's also the reason why they often, when the grandmother dies, start fighting with each other. <laughs> the two things go together. In the city, um, it doesn't work like that, but there is one rule in Portuguese life that is not written anywhere, but that anybody that has done research in Portuguese families knows which is you have to live close to your mother-in-law. This <laughs> is basically the major rule of Portuguese life. You have to live close to your mother-in-law, which means that, and again, in the cities, you know, they have houses of all sorts of families next to each other, but that sense of closeness to the, to the matri side of the family uh, together is, is really what uh, very important. And I talk about this because I think, in fact, the pandemic has been creating a situation which is affecting the Portuguese in a very, very brutal way you have to stay at home. And that means that that sense of connectedness with cousins, aunts, grandparents is broken or can be broken. And that is really a profound traumatic experience. I, I, I can tell you from my own early experiences as a child, I lived half of my time easily in my aunt's place next door. Um, and, 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 and most people have this kind of sense of partible houses, of houses that connect and separate at the same time. And what has happened uh, with the pandemic is that it has broken that and it has created situations where people feel deeply betrayed. They feel betrayed, but the worst thing is that they feel they are betraying others. There have been on TV some scenes that really, uh, you know, the news people happen to film somebody crying for not being able to actually touch the grandmother. They can see them across the window from the uh, old age home, but they can't touch them. And, and, and you know, they're crying. They, they, it's a traumatic, it's a sense of betrayal to, her, to themselves. Um, this, I think, explains largely what is happening right now. Because the first wave of pandemic was quite easy. People dealt with it. They, they just sort of joked about it. They, they all did it. And that was fine. But then came Christmas. 
And all these people that were living in London, in Switzerland, in Germany, they had to return. And it's a bit what Thomas was saying about his son from, from Switzerland. They returned. And, and, and the Portuguese people, the prime minister didn't feel he had the authority to prevent them from connecting with each other. Result, Portugal is today one of the worst places um, uh, 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 for pandemic infections because the Portuguese are familistic. And, and, and I, I can't explain it in, in any other way. It's, uh, it's the sense, it's the sense of continuity where residences don't really have walls, they, they, they interact, they are pushed out, as the Brazilians say, one from the other, they're pulled out one from the other, that produces this, this result, I think. Uh, I'll probably leave it at that at the moment. All right, so thank you very much, João. So, uh, as I said, we have plenty of people online, we have plenty of people following us on Facebook, and we have a huge uh, amount of topics here that have been uh, brought to the floor and discussed thus far. I will now pass to the second round of um, interventions. Our colleague from South Korea has spoken about political problems in North Korea and what home is for people there now in a difficult situation and she has touched upon the issue of refugees which is of course something we have also touched upon here in, in uh, other seminars in other webinars but is always present our colleague from iran has spoken about pandemics and new forms of reinventing home our colleague from um, from israel spoke about home as a space and uh and the global transformation of what home is to each one of us or in each country, in each region. Uh, Thomas from Norway has spoken about pandemics and the relationship with intimacy, with online intimacy, which is something, a very interesting concept. And now João told us about family relations, how they are broken and how people suffer with it. We've had uh, several comments already on the chat, if you look at it, and so we have more comments and more sub themes but before we go to that open discussion i will once again give the floor to the same uh participants who have spoken following the same order so please hank hank am i saying it right this time okay yeah, i've tried <laughs> yes thank you um so do i go now yes please thank okay. you um, so now I'd like to uh, turn to the political symbolism of home and the merging of, merging of political structure and emotional structure, if you will. In the case of North Korea, the nation as a home is not a mere rhetoric. The North Korean state goes to an extreme degree to realize the political vision of building a grand national home in a quite literal sense. Ideally, in the one big loving home, the father leader and the mother party care for the children people and the children serve the parents with fear of piety in return. Not only public buildings, but every North Korean home has portraits of the fathers, Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il in its most presentable part of the house. Um, Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il are the uh, grandfather, grandfather and, and father of the present leader Kim Jong-un. My refugee informant reported that when they were young children, if they brought a special treat from the school, they were told to show it first to the father to thank him. They would present the gift to the portrait, bowing and saying thank you. Only then they would share it among the family members. Not just inside the home, but North Koreans are always with the fathers. When going out, one has to wear a portrait pin on the clothing. In the center of a city or a town are statues or other monuments of the fathers. Whether, it's, whether it is one's home, a public building, or a plaza, the fathers are everywhere as a constant reminder of the one big loving home. But we come to ask, is it loving indeed? To whom? And would North Koreans feel at home in the one big loving home? The teaching of the founding father, and now he is the eternal father, 
Kim Il Sung was that all North Korean people should treat one another as blood relations, just as he would treat them as his own blood relations. In a socialist paradise where all are on equal terms and no one envies anybody, loving care and compassion should extend to beyond your home, thus to make the whole nation a loving home. The state runs a host of political rituals and propaganda sessions on a daily, weekly, and yearly basis to establish a certain structure of feeling among the people. Here, I'd like to emphasize, however, that political repression is not all there is to North Korea. It appears that North Koreans do value and appreciate intimate sociability and familiar affects among themselves under the rubric of a national home, even when its heart is not working. Many North Korean refugees find it depressing that South Koreans generally don't seem humane enough or caring enough, at least not as much as they would expect of Koreans. Of course, the state exercises violence and terror against those who betray the national home. Surveillance, criticism sessions, prison camps, and other repressive apparatuses are run to identify and correct those who harm the national home. In the case of refugees, many suffer from a double sense of betrayal. They regret that they were deserted and betrayed by the father and forced in turn to betray the father and the national home. And their sense of betrayal only reveals that their deeper sense of longing for their home in North Korea and the unfulfilled promise of a national home. Thank you. Thank you very much <clears throat> once again for this. I think it's very, really interesting that we are all having different viewpoints and, and your more political idea of home uh, in your case uh, is really, really interesting, I think, to this discussion. So uh, we'll go ahead with Sohaila from Iran. Um, Please, you have the floor. Thank you. You have to unmute yourself. Your your sound is deactivated. Just click on the little. Uh, is it yeah. okay? There you go. You can yes, it's fine now. Okay. Thank you very much. I just want to add a few more words to what I said before. Um, one thing is the first reaction of people to what happened. And it was very significant because uh, seeing what colleagues wrote to me from the international world, none of them mentioned this. The first reaction was making jokes. In Iran, multitude of jokes went around right after the pandemics. And that speaks uh, about certain spirit of Iranians to take uh, all which is disastrous after feeling it to take distance from it and then to say, okay, I'm above it through making a joke about it. And there were a lot of jokes which came um, and lots of them touched on alcohol and uh, the position of scientists versus the religious man. But the jokes on alcohol were really significant because there were quite a number of them. Um, another point which I would like to make is the number of groups which were made uh, online right after this. A number of music groups were made, a number of uh, mm, performances were offered to people. And there was quite a, a emphasis on dancing. And we have seen people dancing, people singing, group singing, and uh, clips of this send around. And there has been quite a bit of attention to the aesthetic world, to the art world in Iran. And uh, this is really significant to me because it shows the importance of emotions and it shows the high level of importance that people give to the aesthetic world, to poetry. You know, Iran is rich in poetry. So poetry and the other um, arts have been emphasized a lot. And on the soft side, again, we see within the houses 
more attention, which was mentioned by somebody else, more attention being given to plants and to animals. And uh, this importance, which uh, uh, this relating to other forms of being other than humans, um, brings me to a, um, uh, to the question which I'm posing myself, where are we going after the pandemics? Are we going to become more environmental conscious? Are we going to become more humanly oriented or the avaricious side is going to take over? This is really a double side, which I'm looking forward to see in which direction will human society uh, move toward. And uh, I have seen, uh, I've been seeing groups formed, just as I said, uh, artistic groups, but also on friendship and on family side. Well, if before lots of people met, now people have chosen. And I have heard people saying they're using the opportunity to put away certain people and only those who get along very well, they even meet together. So there's also cohesion coming, although that tribal life to which Professor uh, Cabral spoke about, which is very common in Iran also, a group meeting, cousins, and so on and so forth, that has been reduced to a closer and smaller groups of people living um, and sharing space and time together. And this is a change. This is These are changes which we are going to face. Anyway, many thanks. I think I was precise enough not to take your time. Anymore. Thank you very much, Sohaila. Thank you. Yeah. So we've had lots of changes <clears throat> in Portugal. It's a mix of invention with uh, a, a, a Portuguese willingness to really trick uh, things and you know change things around. And so uh, there has been reports, I don't know if real or not, of people having a leash but not having the dog because they are allowed to go out uh, to walk the dogs. And so they would answer the police that, well, the dog went away. So this is, you know, there's all sorts of, uh, of real or unreal relationship with animals. So let's move on to our next colleague from Israel, Nurit. Are you there? Yes, please. Yes, I'm here. Can you, can you hear me? Existential uncertainty in this Zoom uh, performance. So I connect with uh, Pina Kaupal, John, uh, to start with. Israeli society is also very familial in terms of connections, very familial. At the same time, when it comes to the home, it's very different from Portugal in a very interesting way. And I draw here on a five-year research among aspiring middle-class people who go out of town and build and design their own, own homes. They don't build with their own hands, but they entrepreneurially sit with the architect, contract the contractor, they plan their home and it is astounding. On the one hand, family, parents, everybody gives them advice. On the other hand, they, they sit with the architect and they plan their home completely ignorant of next door homes. So you come up with houses that uh, conceal from each other view because on the paper, as a design, there's one home, one family, and, the, and they incorporate Portugal patterns or Swedish patterns whatever their fancy taste to it. Uh, now, if I go back to pandemic time, the home as a unit still feature because familial or familial Israel go to outer, the whole family hire a house or an apartment somewhere else in the countryside so they can all come together against lockdown and whatever, and they convene in these big houses uh, together. At the same time, we have on Airbnb, what they call the online research experience, a PhD student of mine is uh, studying it after Airbnb stopped operating the way it did before, so she couldn't follow what I did before. And here you have five, 10 people sitting in their homes, performing in their homes on Zoom. They learn to cook, they share experiences, they, they are activated to go and and get dressed in a funny way and come back to the screen. So you have this inter-home ex shared experience globally, cross globally. I start, I did, I learned how to do a Japanese tea with a Japanese host. I played a game with the American people 
uh, together with my students who initiated and I took part in it. So you have this home, more than uh, what Thomas said, it's not just seeing the, the prime minister decoration, it's actually involving the whole home and I want to bring a ginger and I want, I want to bring a kettle and we do our domestic jobs with each other, cross space, cross time, uh, in a way again that contravenes the idea of home, familiar, familial connection uh, with strangers. So I leave it at that. Thank you very much. So we'll have Thomas again. Please, Thomas Erickson. Yes, yes. Well, thanks very much. Uh, there are so many things to talk about. I mean, I mean, but it's no wonder that these issues to do with home and I suppose with community are being raised time and time again in, in anthropology and in social theory because they're very fundamental concepts, but they're chronically contested and always have been. And we have an idea, I guess, some of us, that it's being contested in, in, in more acute ways now than before because of the electronic revolution which has destabilized some connections okay with place and ethnicity and so on and because of uh, of migration and because of the very speed of these transformations so home and community are continuously being challenged right now uh, i've uh, been thinking um, about a text that i read as a student and uh, which somehow left a lasting impression on me called the homeless mind by Berger, Berger and Kellner, you know, Peter Berger, his wife, and, uh, and the third uh, author, which is about alienation. It's a very sort of Durkheimian book, in a sense, about not being at home in your own mind, because you, you feel that, you know, you, you can't really feel integrated as a person. That's a third sense in which we can use the term home, I guess. I mean, one is the physical place, the physical home. Another is uh, what Rao really spoke about. I mean, the, the community, I mean, uh, the extended family, which, wherever they are, you are at home. Uh, we, we sometimes see like even those of us who live in very small communities, like you only have a nuclear family, wherever your family is, you can feel at home if they're happy. Uh, it doesn't really matter where it is. So that, those are the two, the social and the physical. And then you have the psychological feeling of home. And the, th and the fourth one was really the one brought up by Hyang, who spoke about the North Koreans. You have to have a photo or a, or a painting or a picture of, 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 the, of the great leader in a prominent place in their home. Uh, which is an extreme version of uh, Benedict Anderson's imagined community. You know, the home as a, as a metaphorical house. Uh, you're at home everywhere, as long as you stay within the country's boundaries. And this is one thing that the pandemic has brought, isn't it? A heightened awareness of boundaries. More uh, concern with boundaries, a very sort of Mary Douglas-ish obsession with impurity coming from outside. Everybody speaks about the impurity coming from outside. Some blame the minorities. Around here, we read occasionally about this in the papers, how the Somalis in the eastern suburbs of Oslo are more infected, etc. And the Polish guest workers who brought the virus back with them <laughs> when they returned from the Christmas holiday. Uh, and I mean, all of this may be true, but it, there's a heightened awareness. It's a crisis as a magnifying glass, isn't it? How it uh, sort of blows up tendencies that you've already seen. Digitalization being one, uh, suspicion of others uh, being, being another. So we have these four meanings of home. And, and it may be that it could be fruitful to think about this, but I'd like to enter uh, in my last minute uh, 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 another, uh, but I'm not unrelated point to do with the way we think about who we are in the world. With the electronic revolution, some thought that we might find a home in cyberspace, but it didn't work because cyberspace is sterile, doesn't give you any memories, doesn't give you any experiences. Cyberspace is just a place where the bank keeps your money. You know, so it's, 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 it's in a sense, it's empty. Um, and uh, uh, so, so, so that didn't, didn't work. But then um, perhaps you can distinguish between different ways of moving and different ways of being at home. What we've seen during the pandemic is an increased, I mean, an extreme reduction of mobility. So that a colleague in Denmark told me the other day that, uh, you know, since March, she had never been more than 12 kilometers from her home from where she lived, her home, her flat. No more than 12 kilometers, that's eight miles. And she usually travels, you know, around the world to give talks and take part in seminars and so on. And she smiled, she was smiling as she said this. She thought it was a rather nice thing. And as, as for myself, I also become familiar with my own neighborhood in, the, in a very new way, because I go for walks all the time, nearby, right? Within walk, everything within walking distance. So that's, that's one, one dimension uh, uh, that, that is interesting to look into when it comes to the effects on 
home, space, uh, distance, uh, and, and so on uh, of, of the of the pandemic. But I'd just like to mention one other example, just to um, to increase the uh, the complexity uh, uh, even even more. Um, because one of my other field sites, Australia, they're doing rather well uh, regarding the pandemic. Uh, they don't have many cases. They they they, they behave almost like normal. I mean, they've had lockdowns in Melbourne and so on, but a bit exaggerated. But they just wanted to keep it down, and they've done so. So they can travel quite freely. They can live fairly normally, but they can't leave the country. Maybe not until next year. Maybe they won't be allowed to leave the country. And if they do, they can't return, not until 2022. Uh, but it's a big country. But what we have seen is that people no longer move out of the country, but trade has really picked up. So exports from Australia to China have increased during the pandemic, mainly of wheat and iron ore, which, which, is, which is odd, isn't it? It's a bit counterintuitive. Uh, so perhaps this is happening, that the mobility of people is reduced but not necessarily the mobility of goods or electronic signals, such as movies or Netflix or financial instruments. And where does this leave us regarding home? I think there is a, there's a lot more to be explored here. And the pandemic is a privileged moment in which to do it because it's global and it's so exceptional and it brings everything so out of kilter uh, that uh, it reveals things that we uh, were only dimly aware of, if at all, before. Uh, thank you so much, Thomas, for all those insights. Of course, uh, as we've seen, there's so many, I mean, home is such a broad subject and there's so many other themes that connect to this one. But actually we have seen that this happens in almost all the seminars. All the seminars that have a specific theme bind or relate to other ones and to other themes and to even themes that we've discussed in webinars. So, um, so we'll see, okay. <laughs> So the next one, uh, once again, last but not least, Shwampina Cabral from Lisbon, please. Can you hear me? Great. Um, well, I wanted to pick up a little bit on what Thomas was saying and uh, on what Sohela was saying and uh, on what Cheng, uh, Cheng Jin, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, was saying um, to do with with betrayal. Um, and I want to speak about that a little bit. Um, just a quick note to respond to Muggsy's note. Um, tourism, yes, is important, but it doesn't seem to have been the major factor in Portugal because we didn't have a problem after the, the, the summer. We had a problem after Christmas. So it would seem that tourism, yeah, it's a contributing factor, but it wasn't really the problem. The problem is more with returning migrants uh, 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 and with people circulating at Christmas time, I suspect. But to go back to the theme of betrayal, you know, the thing with betrayal is that if you're going to have love, you're going to have betrayal. The two thing, things necessitate each other. You can't have one without the other. It's like life and death. Um, and, and betrayal is really something strange because you often do not know how to speak of it. Whilst you have ways of speaking of love, you don't really have ways of speaking of betrayal. Um, not openly, not so that afterwards you feel well about yourself. Um, and, and that is a problem that is increasingly happening. I mean, Cristiano Bastos was making some notes in, 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 in the chat room um, uh, about the way in which people are feeling increasingly oppressed. And I wanted to say something about that because as you feel oppressed by your children in a small apartment in the middle of Lisbon or in the middle of London, um, as, you, as you feel oppressed by your mother um, and your sense of relief of going and coming back to school disappears and suddenly you got your mother on top of you all the time. Um, you, that sense of oppression doesn't really have a language for itself. Uh, uh, and, uh, and it yields a, a, a kind of phantasmagoric experience. And I wanted to speak about that because for example, 
it has, or, or rather, it has two aspects. On the one hand, um, it in, it tend, particularly closing schools, has tended to close young people's uh, in uh, 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 landscape. It, it 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 closes it, with two results. One is that sense of oppression, and the other is that they don't make connections and they don't learn. So there is an increase um, of class differentiation. So that the people whose parents are willing and capable of teaching them are increasingly being uh, uh, treated, uh, having a different condition from the people whose parents aren't. Uh, 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 and that sense of class differentiation then connects with the sense of oppression. Because of course, if your parents can teach you and are capable of that, probably your house is also larger and you don't feel so oppressed. And so there is this, 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 this kind of perfect storm stewing up, um, uh, uh, which, which curiously, for example, the TV doesn't speak about it, but the biggest surges in pandemic in Portugal have been amongst gypsy families. Uh, so that, this is not uh, by chance. It has to do precisely with a combination of uh, 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 of all sorts of uh, uh, of um, uh, 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 difficulties in your life. Okay, so I wanted to speak about this because the Portuguese having this culture where they don't really demonstrate themselves, um, uh, where it doesn't really sort of look well to have very extreme attitudes. You don't really feel it so much, but we've just had the Danish going out and the, uh, protesting against lockdown and the kids that were in the middle of Copenhagen demonstrating without masks were yelling, we are Denmark. This is interesting. They were claiming a sense of citizenship and they were feeling that somehow they couldn't tell somebody had taken their citizenship away from them. But this gets worse because in Rotterdam, they were yelling Jews, Jews. Now, what are, it's, for me, it's hard to understand what that could possibly mean. It's, 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 a, it's a very, um, the, it, 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 it's, it's a sense of an oppression that that you do not know who to blame, and so you blame you blame the devil. You 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 you, you blame this phantasmagoria um, uh, who, who who comes on you. Now, before I stop, I wanted to say something about this because I feel that it is really our responsibility to start preparing. Democratic societies are, have a, a particular form of jeopardy, which is politically, political irrationality. Political irrationality attacks democratic societies more than others. If you live in a democratic society, people can vote irrationally. They can go out into the streets like the Portuguese candidate to the president of the Republic who's just come out second saying, let's get rid of subsidy dependence. And then you sort of ask, what does he mean subsidy dependence? And of course, you know what he means. He means gypsies and migrants, right? Like the, like, like the, 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 the people in Rotterdam mean Jews. Or they don't probably have Jews around, but doesn't matter. It's the Jews that they have. And the, the, these guys are subsidy dependents. The problem is, that it's the very people that vote for getting rid of subsidy dependence that are subsidy dependent. They are engaging in irrationality. And, and so I think it's, it is something that we have to be very careful and that we have to kind of, actually it's our responsibility to look out because I think the perfect storm could still come. I, I, I think we, we, we are uh, creating the conditions for something that might not be nice. Thank you. 
Okay, so we've had uh, around uh, two rounds uh, for each one. Now we have tons of different topics here in the chat. And so it's hard to, to be able to, to discuss all this. But anyway, basically we have the, the idea of uh, different concepts of home. For instance, what is home for homeless communities? That's a topic in itself. The idea of home and loneliness, which is something that has already been touched upon. Um, the concept of loving home, what is the loving home? And then, of course, the, the idea, well, the, the, the issue of violence and uh, the, the fact that there's people cannot experience funerals, cannot experience being with the elderly, that has already also been touched upon. New perspectives of home for young people, and Juan just uh, touched upon some of that when he mentioned the riots in Rotterdam, also in Amsterdam, and in Copenhagen. And of course, uh, now in the last uh, talk of Juan, he mentioned oppression. And actually, it's quite interesting, I think, that oppression brings us back to the circle and, you know, to our first speaker, our colleague from South Korea, and, and a place where oppression is really felt. And of course, it's probably more felt now during pandemics, but also oppression relates to another theme that has been touched upon several times in the chat, which is the issue of violence. And uh, we have also already spoken about violence in one of the webinars. I I think we'll probably have to have a webinar just on the topic of violence, unfortunately, because it does exist and it does seem uh, to have gone even to higher levels now in this worldwide um, pandemic and turbulent time. So, you know, violence can be either a side of pain and violence, but it can also be domestic violence. It can be violence against women, uh, violence against refugees, um, as also Hing Hing Yung mentioned. And, and so, we have this issue of oppression and violence, unfortunately, really coming up in these turbulent times. So um, since we've, you've all had your turn of five minutes each, and with all these issues that are in the chat and even more uh, in mind, I would now just open the floor to discussion. So uh, any, any one of the participants of the speakers that wants to go ahead, please raise your hand, either, either virtually or in reality, and I'll give you the word. So the first one I can see is Thomas. So please, Thomas. Yeah, just very quickly on the, on the subject of domestic violence and domestic conflict. I mean, one of the interesting things that we can see, not least within Europe, is the differences in kinship systems, okay, and the difference in kinship practices, where the nuclear family is crucial in Northern Europe, whereas the extended family, or maybe even the lineage, is more important in Southern Europe. And, and this is being revealed, as, as Ralph points out, and as several others have confirmed, in, in very visible ways during the pandemic. Now, regarding violence, I think in many countries where homeschooling has been common, uh, there are sort of there are three kinds of children: those who are bored, those who are relieved because finally they can get away from the bullies, okay? Uh, because they dislike and they hate school because they don't have any friends and everybody hates them. And then you have the third category who are desperate and unhappy because they're being beaten up and being being uh, treated badly at home. So this all this shows again. I mean that there's a whole fan of different responses and that many inequalities and issues in society are being brought up in a, in a highly visible way during this uh, crisis. Clara, we are not hearing you. Clara, yes. we are not hearing you. We're not hearing you. You have to unmute yourself. Come on, Clara, I just unmute yourself. Hello, 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 yes. can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, it's not, I, I knew I was not, uh, I was on mute, but the problem is somehow the screen made me disappear so I could not unmute myself because I could not see myself. So it's this technological tricks. So thank you very much, Thomas. Who wants to go next to, to, to comment on all these issues that have been, um, somehow my screen went strange. Instead of having the five main speakers, I have everybody spread all over the screen. So it's kind of hard to figure out who wants to talk now, but please just un Unmute yourself, whoever wants to talk, and, and start. Uh, Shohea? Yes, you're talking, but you have to unmute yourself, please. 
We cannot hear you. Okay. Okay, uh, now we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I, it, it's not a comment. There is so much to be really talked about. Uh, but since I have to leave in about 45 minutes, I would like to uh, know what is inside this chat. I would like to know what are the questions and how is the reaction of everyone all over the world? Is it possible to know that a little bit? Yes, uh, you will be able to, uh, you, I don't know if you are watching the, if you can read the chat, but anyway, the chat will be also be posted on the website. So you'll be able oh, okay. to see okay, later fine. on, you'll thank be you. able to see all the comments and, and the, the okay. that okay. has been going on on the, on okay. the, thank you. On the chat, okay? okay? Um, now, Thomas was saying that he thinks domestic violence has nothing to do with this, but different kinship practices lead to different forms of socializing. When I mentioned social, domestic violence, uh, you know, I was thinking directly of things that, like I said, we've touched upon in this webinars, such as domestic violence against women or domestic in the nation sense of violence, of national violence against, like Joan was saying, refugees against uh, people who are sort of as out of the nation and, and, and you know, this kind of demon that people are blaming uh, for this, this whole pandemic situation. Nurit, please yeah. go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I just want to observe our discussion, which shows how home is such a basic notion and at the same time, it's so elusive there have been anthropology of kinship, anthropology of whatever your consumption, anthropology of gender division of labor, everything that the home is part, inevitable part of it, and yet we hardly have an anthropology of home. And our discussion here really demonstrate how we go to violence, how we go to betrayal, death, uh, whatever came here. As it's, and it's an occasion to actually to say to urge doing an anthropology of home, the pandemic time just emphasized how important it is, what amazing part it constitutes in our life, especially now as we stay 24 hour, 24 seven at home. Uh, so it's a really good opportunity to, to, to observe myself and everybody else, how easy it is to run away from the from anthropology of home and to try to focus on it. Thank you so much. Uh, no, did I see a hand here? Um, João, did you raise your hand? Can't hear you. <laughs> Can't hear I you. did, but I can say something. Okay, go ahead. Could always say something. I, mean, I, I think that uh, 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 Thomas's point about um, about the different uh, familial responses. Um, he, he is right. Um, not everybody reacts in the same way. Um, but my point had to do with the way um, the, uh, the, the way a home enclosure uh, 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 functions in a stochastic manner with class differentiation. It's a stochastic manner. One goes this way, another goes this way, but then in the end, the general direction tends to be that way. Um, and, 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 and I think that the, 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 uh, uh, the way in which uh, the, the, the home enclosure comes to, uh, to uh, affect in a composite and complex manner, uh, class differentiation in Portugal uh, is one of the preoccupations that, that I have. And I think it probably works all over the world and certainly all over Europe. Uh, but in, in Portugal, it, it worries me because we had a period in which through, school, uh, uh, through uh, education, there was kind of a general leveling out of the population okay, the super rich were becoming super rich and super and super rich over there in heaven where they live. But um, there was a sense of, in the public sphere, of a kind of an equalization of the population. And I fear that that might have come to a term. And, 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 and this is something that, um, in one hand, you know, you say, you say oh, what does this have to do with the fact that the, 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 the size of the living room is uh, larger or slightly less large? 
but it does have to do with that if you are enclosing a home. Yes, but what, what about what about Juan? What about situations that we were talking about of refugees or homeless? Uh, those have no home. <laughs> they have no home. So, well, that's actually quite interesting, right? Because one of the first responses it would seem, though I don't know, because this is not an area I research, was for providing greater, greater coverage for people that, were, that did not have home. And in many cities, this was a, a big effort that was made. Um, whether that resulted uh, in, in, in reducing the level, of, the number of people that were out uh, living outdoors, I do not know. I know that in Portugal, uh, some of that was done, and uh, 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 and uh, I know that, for example, in Manchester, much of that was done. Um, I know for for particular cities that an effort was made to do with that. Of course, the thing that is so strange is that um, the people that go out into the streets demonstrating are not the people that are suffering more. So it's the migrants, it's the, it's the recent people that haven't had time to accom accommodate, uh, uh, accumulate a proper home environment. They're the ones that must be suffering tremendously, but they don't say a thing in public. They don't get hurt because they know that if the moment they say something in public, it's gonna turn against them. And, and that is really something that is a bit eerie, you know, you, you don't hear in Portugal people from the African, uh, 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 migrants from Africa protesting in the streets. You, do, you don't hear that. Um, and, and you wonder, well, they are the ones that are suffering most. Um, why don't you hear them? You see, and, and that's really something that is up to us to kind of think about. Okay. Uh, well, my name is Cecilia Montero Mortul. I am researching uh, about uh, recycling with La Ducien Vides of Chef. And through that, uh, I was watching as well what happened with the cleaning at the homes, the chores, the relations, how they work with all the, the stuff that they have in their houses. Uh, how in the beginning all the the rubbish were growing, um, and I, as I am working as well as a teacher, as not all the time part time, uh, I can pick up a lot of new things from the kids, um, and how disgusting is for them many times and no, at the same time no. Um, they have. I, I think we have to study the narratives and the practices uh, through the time because England has a very long period of lockdown, and there were a lot of discussions uh, how to do it or not to do it, and a lot of death as well. So, and in the middle of political. Um, mm, uh, differences than before. So um, it, it, we cannot, we can do a comparative, uh, we can learn from others. Uh, and now I am very focusing with the chores because it show me a lot of things that I am writing, I write in very much, I do on my own, eh? uh, but um, that's all to communicate that and I am happy to see that the home has again a, a place. I did as well a work in Barcelona with some group of social uh, photograph. It calls domestic. I can send you uh, different ways of living in Western society, no, in other societies, no, and um, and can be even in this moment show us for uh, with this idea of before and after that I am not totally agree what happens as well, no. We can analyze that. 
That's all. And I am very happy to to have this meeting. I was having as well my lunch <laughs> quickly and my mate. <laughs> and that is. Thank you very much. And lovely to see you, Shao, Thomas. Very nice. Thank you. I, uh, thank you very much, Cecilia. And I think Shohela wanted to say something. Yes. Um, I. As this. You have to unmute yourself. Yes. Hi there. Yes, there you is are. Okay? Yes. Okay. Um, no, I, as this topic is becoming more and more topical, uh, people in the streets who are uh, who are seen more and more is the garbage collectors, and not just the garbage collectors, the regular garbage collectors, but people who search for plastic and paper stuff, and they are very young, you can see 70, 70 year old kid to elderly people. And we have absolutely no statistics on them if they're affected by this virus or not. How many of them might have died so far? We have no idea of uh, their health situation at all. And they are being seen more and more. They're not demonstrating that their presence is definitely uh, felt by lots of people, but you're sort of helpless on how we can really assess their problem and how to solve their problem. Anyway, I thought I should make it. Thank you very much, Shahida. We are coming to, to a, an end because normally we don't take more than one and a half, one and a half hours in the seminars. Um, uh, These webinars normally take one and a half hour. So while well, we're now in the topic of, you know, oppression, violence, all sorts of different violences. Uh, Virginia on the chat was also mentioning mourning, which I think, you know, the, 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 the religious aspects of, and the lack of rituals. And um, I think should be probably another topic on our webinars because it's something that is really affecting everyone worldwide. But before we finish, uh, perhaps we should finish with something a bit brighter than just oppression and violence, but I give the word to Thomas who wanted to speak, please. Yes, yes, just very, just very briefly. Thanks very much, Clara. And thanks everyone. This has been wonderful. It's given us so many ideas and not least about how to do research and what to do research on. I'd just like to mention a monograph that was published in the early 1980s by my late colleague, Marianne Gullestar, called Kitchen Table Society, which was an early study you know, of the domestic sphere. And it's no coincidence that she, as a Norwegian anthropology, working at home, in her hometown, in fact, studied the domestic sphere, because it's so important, domesticity, the house, the home, what it looks like in your living room, in your kitchen, where you invite guests, where you don't invite guests, such as into the parents' bedroom. She had all of that laid out in, in this wonderful book. And Mariana was accused by some of her colleagues later on for being home blind. I thought I should end on that, you know, home blindness, which is that which you don't see because you're enmeshed in it. You know, if you work in your own community, even in, in your own city, there are so many things you don't see as anthropologists because you take them for granted. So not only is home a positive thing, but we can also become home blind if we don't watch out. Exactly. Thank you so much, Thomas. So does anyone else of the speakers uh, want to say something as a finishing um, comment, please? Okay, so if not, we've been here one and a half hour, which is normally the time we take. I think it's been a really fascinating uh, webinar. I thank everyone. It, we've had topics from really more political topics to very home uh, issues of, uh, of, the, of life in everyday, um, in our everyday homes. And I think that's, that's basically what this was meant to be a webinar where the concept of home, where we show that the comp concept of home can actually be so uh, various. So, 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 you know, there's so many various ways of thinking of home and uh, of the lack of home also, and uh, how we are binded to home now in this uh, pandemic times, but also in other turbulent times. So once again, uh, thank you everyone for being present. Uh, please remember that this will be posted on the website, also the chat, and that, that this has been streamed uh, on, live on Facebook. And thank you very much to the speakers, all our colleagues from all over the world. And we hope to see you in the next webinar, which will probably take place towards the end of March or early April. And it will probably be a Spanish webinar. What we're trying to do is besides this 
international webinars where we have people from all over the world. And of course, we use English as the common uh, intelligible language. We are also trying to do as WCA as an organization that really wants to give voice to everyone all over the world. We're also trying to pull out some webinars in Spanish or in uh, Chinese, we don't know. We're, we're trying to see the possibilities. Of course, it will cut out part of the audience, but it will also give voice and uh, hearing to other people who normally cannot attend these webinars. So we'll see, please, uh, we'll keep you posted on the website and thank you very much again have a great day and or night and please stay safe bye